Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about AMD. We're going to talk about Nvidia versus Apple. And we're going to talk about a company that we're interested in, Pure Storage. So we'll start with our first topic here, AMD, the MI300 and the Bergamo. AMD recently released some information at an AI event and made it seem like this is a big deal. But is this actually a big deal? Is this anything new, Nick, or are we just hearing fluff? Before continuing, let me remind you to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if this video is helpful as you do your own investment research and increase your knowledge of business and technology. We really appreciate the support as subscribing to the channel helps us continue putting out content like this. But there is definitely a lot of AI fluff out there right now. So Casey, yes, this was an AI chip event AMD has had scheduled for a while, took place on June 13th. And what they announced was mostly old news. They basically provided some, some new specs, some new information on some chips that we, we really already knew were coming down the pipeline. So the first up here is the Bergamo. This is the code name they've given their Zen 4C. This is this is a data center cloud centric CPU using AMD's new chiplet architecture. And chiplets you can think of uh, like a bunch of very very tiny little Lego blocks that companies are starting to stitch together onto an integrated circuit versus like maybe one single silicon die like historically has been the case. Now, what's great about Bergamo, it is compatible with AMD's previous gen Genoa cloud chip. So you can see AMD kind of playing off of the uh, Italian Renaissance cities here with these, these code names. And it will provide a performance boost. That's going to be ramping up production later this year. The next chip that they talked about, again, we knew this was been coming. We've actually known about it for quite some time, but the MI300 Instinct. Uh, this is a basically a GPU accelerator system. It will, it's, it's a combination CPU and GPU acceleration. This is designed to compete with NVIDIA's latest H100 system. Now, outside of the cloud, uh, AMD also talked about the Genoa X. This is for technical, primarily non-cloud specific application workloads. They also are getting into more into the networking chip space. So they talked about their P4 DPU, DPU being a data processing unit. That is via their acquisition of Pensando that they made last year. And ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, Casey, we will talk about this an increasing amount here uh, because AMD is really releasing these new chips, of course, to tackle this brand new market that has been created for generative AI training, large language model training. AMD said that this is a market that's currently maybe worth about $30 billion a year right now, going to maybe $150 billion in about the next five years. Who knows if that will actually transpire or not, but AMD's Achilles heel at this point is a, a lack of software, specifically a software library for all of this AI training. And then unlike NVIDIA, which has really built this top layer, a software subscription service that has transformed NVIDIA into a full-blown platform, or at least the beginning stages of a platform service, AMD does not have that yet. Victor Pang, which is AMD's new AI head, and he came over from Xilinx. He was the CEO there. He's stated that he that that AMD is working on this Rock M software. So obviously, they do want to compete with Nvidia in this space. Yeah, that's an excellent point, and this is definitely something we should we should monitor. Casey, we're we're a fan of Xilinx. We were actually Xilinx shareholders long before AMD made that acquisition last February, February, 2022, Victor Pang, a uh, fantastic job over there heading up Xilinx. And I think the merits of AMD acquiring Xilinx continue to, to stack up. 
right? Obviously it broke them into like a brand new market, the FPGA market, which opened the door to more data center design wins, automotive, industrial, and so on. But the nature of FPGAs, these field programmable chips, means that there is more software library there. And so it's interesting to see Victor Peng now heading up AMD's newly created AI division and maybe leveraging some of that software expertise that Xilinx had already to try to bolster uh, what AMD can do to, to basically catch up with NVIDIA here. Uh, it's not going to be easy, though. Uh, NVIDIA has been dedicating a lot of time and resources, at least a decade and a half, to getting to where they are today. Um, and so simply making the Xilinx acquisition, launching its own AI division and calling it good isn't going to cut it. So definitely something worth monitoring, though, for AMD shareholders going forward. We do like AMD. We love NVIDIA. And speaking of NVIDIA... Apple made some interesting claims recently that I know got you a little riled up, Nick. So tell me about what Apple said that makes it seem like they're competing with NVIDIA. Okay, this is the rant segment. Maybe we should display the uh, press release that Apple put out last week. This sort of got a lot less attention than the Vision Pro, which we already kind of had. Well, you had your little mini rant about last week. You're not ready for the metaverse or living inside of a headset, but you know, these things are coming anyways. The other thing that Apple announced was the M2 Ultra. So we know Apple has been designing its own processors for the MacBook and more recently the Mac lineup of computers. It's now at this point fully replaced Intel in that lineup. Intel is gone. Intel's not making processors for any of Apple's computers anymore. And what has replaced them are these M series chips, which are based on ARM architecture, super energy efficient designs, basically what they, they designed for the iPhone, supersized it. And now you've got the very similar experience that many of you have come to love on the iPhone on your Apple laptops and PCs. So what the M2 Ultra is, is it's actually two M2 Max chips networked together. So this is an all-in-one unit, C supersized CPUs plus GPU acceleration. Uh, these are very, very expensive workstations geared particularly towards uh, those that are in some sort of professional visualization. Uh, so they might be graphical designers, maybe those that work in the movie industry, the video game industry and such, you need like a super powered workstation to do some very high end uh, graphics rendering. That's what Apple has geared these units towards. Based on this press release, it looks like this computer would work very well for Chipstock Investor and my video editing. Indeed it would. Uh, it would be the only Apple piece of hardware in our uh, kind of extensive um, setup here of hardware, but I don't know. Are you getting one or are we are we sticking with Windows? No, I don't know the first thing about an Apple operating system. I haven't used that since I was in elementary school. So I don't think I, I don't think I'm ready to change even for something like this. So obviously these are best in class chips. They sound absolutely amazing. So why the rant? Okay, I'm taking issue with this paragraph right here where Apple talks about game-changing unified memory architecture. Okay, fine. This, again, like this is a super powered system architecture that includes CPUs, GPU acceleration. But at the end of this paragraph here, it says, for example, M2 Ultra can train massive machine learning workloads in a single system that the most powerful discrete GPU can't even process. And then there's a footnote here, number three. So scrolling all the way to the end of this press release, footnote number three says, testing was con conducted by Apple in April 2023 using pre-production Mac Studio systems with Apple M2 Ultra. 76 core GPU and 192 gigs of RAM 
as well as a PC system with NVIDIA RTX A6000 graphics uh, with 48 gigs of GDDR6. Okay, here's my issue. Apple's M2 Ultra system is a complete unit with CPU and GPU. The NVIDIA RTX A6000 is a discrete GPU, meaning it does not have a CPU in it. So it is not possible to process machine learning or train machine learning workloads on an A6000 standalone system. So basically Apple is comparing their top of the line system, which is a brand new computing system with CPU, accelerated GPU graphics to an NVIDIA RTX A6000 that's a discrete GPU. It does not have a built-in CPU with it. And so it's relying on a PC system to coordinate that workload. And Apple is very vague as to what that workstation is exactly. It just says simply PC system. So uh, I'm not going to say this is false advertising, but this is really Apple's actual superpower. They have these amazing pieces of hardware, but they really, really know how to kind of stretch the limits here when drawing comparisons to the competition. That's my primary beef. Would you even want to train a large language model with one of these? Yeah, that's another potential problem with this press release, Casey, uh, at least as far as I can tell. So machine learning being a branch of AI, uh, neither of these systems were really designed for AI model training or machine model training. Like I mentioned, uh, Apple's, uh, Apple's workstations primarily designed for professional visualization. That's what they do. And this... NVIDIA RTX A6000 series also primarily designed for professional visualization, not AI or machine learning training. Uh, at this point, as everyone has come to know, machine learning and AI training takes place primarily in a data center. Uh, it would take forever to train an AI model on either of these machines. So this claim that Apple is making that they could do it doesn't mean you would. And it's kind of like going to a sports car dealer and the sports car dealer is like, we have an optional tow hitch on our sports car and our competition doesn't offer that at all. Okay, great. But like, do you really want a tow hitch on your sports car? Probably not. Um, so does it matter that the competition doesn't have a tow hitch as an option? I don't know. I'm, I'm skeptical here. Amazing piece of hardware, absolutely. Uh, a great market Apple is going after with this particular M2 Ultra chip. But come on, Apple, you already make amazing stuff. Do you really need to kind of stretch the limits with your with your PR department here? Well, I guess all I can say is the more sales for Apple, the more revenue and the better the stock price. So press on Apple. Talking about all these different computing chips and AI, I think it's a good time to segue into our final portion of our show about pure storage. But before we talk about that company, let's discuss the three main ingredients in an AI system. Okay, that's a good idea. So Casey, we have been talking just, just now about compute. That's like the sexy part of an AI system that has captured the public's attention here. These are like your NVIDIA's, your AMD's, to a lesser extent these days, your Intel's. These are chips that do the actual computing, that actually crunch the numbers to train the AI model. So that's one ingredient. You need compute chips, processors, and GPUs, those are accelerators. So you actually need both of those. You need a CPU to kind of help coordinate the flow and the uh, actual instruction set. And then you need GPUs to like rip through all of that data that's needed to train AI. The second ingredient, networking. This is a piece of the puzzle that I think has become increasingly focused on thanks to a little company called Broadcom and as well as what we like to call it baby Broadcom, 
Marvell Technology Group. So in an AI system, you've got all of these GPU clusters, uh, these compute pieces crunching through the data, but you need a way to connect all of those clusters together and kind of coordinate the movement of all of that data. So that's where your networking chips come in. Like we've talked about in previous videos, these are kind of like the highway and freeway infrastructure of a data center and of an AI system. And then the last thing is storage. All of this data has to be stored somewhere. Memory is, of course, very critical to AI, as it is with any computing system. But in AI, it requires an exponential amount of storage capacity. Historically, we have invested in this portion of this three ingredient list in Micron technology for the storage portion. But we're going to talk about another storage company here today because some investors may not have the stomach for Micron. And we'll show a couple of charts here, uh, just Micron over the past year and then Micron over the last decade. And it, it paints a picture here of why you may not like Micron as an investor because of its cyclicality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Casey, sometimes I'm not sure that I have the stomach for investing in Micron, depending on the year. You know, what's interesting about, about this, you, you put the chart up here showing Micron stocks wild ride uh, over the last decade. But interestingly enough, in spite of these absolutely insane ups and downs, as of late, uh, more down than, than, than up, Micron has still actually been a pretty good stock. It has handily beaten the S&P 500 at the end of the day, in spite of these absolutely gut-wrenching twists and turns. Uh, more than 400% up over the last decade versus about 170% for the S&P. So at the end of the day, uh, Micron, not really a bad stock. You just kind of have to take it with the lumps. And, you know, if you're kind of averse to these extreme swings. Uh, these are pretty big lumps. Well, they are based in Idaho, so maybe you like your mashed potatoes a little a little lumpy. Uh, you're so funny. Okay. Maybe we should talk about historically why the memory chip market, the storage component of any computing system is so wildly cyclical, right? Yes. The memory chip market is extremely cyclical because when the demand is high, the prices for the chips are high, and therefore the profits are fantastic. But in times like Micron is going through right now, the demand has decreased, the price of the chips has decreased, and then as a result, of course, profitability is next to nothing at this point. Yeah, or, um, you know, at times the last couple of quarters, negative. So uh, this is... Uh, this is this is the problem with Micron and you, some of the other major players here, Samsung and SK Hynix. Um, there does appear to be another merger, potentially possibly yet another merger in the memory market uh, about to be announced between Keoxia and Western Digital. That could help shore things up over the long term. But historically, yeah, you're right, Casey. Demand sends pricing all over the place. And so you get sky high profits and then low, low, low profits. And that's reflected in these crazy share prices. But we've landed on potentially a solution for our woes, right? Yes, we did. And that company is Pure Storage. And I find this a little interesting because of your rage against subscriptions. So we're going to do, <laughs> dive into this a little bit more about why you think this subscription service is worth it. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I do rage against subscriptions. There is a subscription for everything, even though it may be a product or service we do not need every month. Um, so I get tired of it. But, you know, there is still a time and a place for subscription. Maybe this is one of them if you're a big business and you have data storage needs. Why don't you tell us about pure storage, Casey? 
Okay, yes, Peer Storage is a data storage provider. And interestingly, they do this storage as a service model. And that's where the subscription portion of it comes in. Started in 2009, IPO'd in 2015, and then in 2018 is when they introduced this as a service model. Also, let's talk a little bit about the portfolio, the products that Pure Storage has. You can either use their hardware that's in a data center, accessing that data remotely via the internet, or you can actually purchase the hardware. And you can see some of the applications they have here as far as infrastructure operations and applications in their portfolio. Yeah, and this is an important point, Casey, because Pure Storage is basically a pretty young company, but it does have some competition here because of course, uh, enterprise storage products are not new. And so you have competition like Hewlett Packard Enterprise, HPE, not to be confused with HPQ, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, NetApp, Dell Technologies. Historically, these companies sell the actual storage systems. So these are basically uh, components of a server or, or outright servers that primarily just maybe it archives data or it's data that's needed for the operation uh, of an app. But I, I think the, the breakthrough here with Pure Storage's system is that subscription business model that they have begun layering in on top of the actual um, the actual storage devices themselves. This chart, Nick, that you put together was really interesting because we know that, like as we mentioned before, Micron's profitability is next to nothing or even negative. And Pure Storage actually, as far as their hardware and digital memory systems goes, has not necessarily been growing, but what has been growing is their subscription revenue. And you can see that in this chart here, since 2020, we've had, well, very, very good year over year growth in their subscription services. And it's becoming an increasing part of their total revenue. Yeah. And that's, that's a big differentiator thing here, I think, especially in this market where the actual sale of memory chips is is down, uh, where this is like one of the worst drawdowns in 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 demand and thus inventory of memory chips in at least the last 20 years. And yet the subscription service continues to chug along. So pure storage, yes, hit by the reduction in demand for the actual the actual storage devices themselves, but the subscription continues to go up. So they've sort of like bridged this very wide, deep canyon the last year. Uh, and, and now starting to get renewed interest, of course, more interest in the subscription, but also a comeback in the actual hardware itself. This might be an interesting time to start nibbling on a stock like Pure Storage. Of course, this is excluding the AI bit from this whole discussion. Uh, of course, with this massive amount of data needed to train AI systems, this could be a huge, huge growth driver for all memory chip makers and memory storage device makers like Pure Storage alike. But perhaps even removing that from the equation, we've reached a cyclical bottom here and the memory market starting to make a comeback. I was looking at a couple of charts in Main Street data here, Nick, that I had a question about. So looking first looking at the operating income chart, it's pretty lumpy. And you see in the most recent quarter, it's actually negative around 72 million. But then a uh, second chart here on that actually the company provided on their free cash flow, it looks like they're highly profitable. So can you explain the differences between these two charts? Good observation here, Casey. So there you, you showed the chart that we made already about the company's transition, kind of gradual transition here to more subscription revenue. But at the end of the day, more than half of their sales still come from the actual sale of of systems, of actual hardware. So this is not a completely silky smooth subscription-based business. 
you're you're still going to get even though they're not based in Idaho <laughs> like Micron you're still going to get your lumps here and that's what you're saying with the actual operating income and loss a lot of this has to do with timing of when they bring components in to build the systems and then eventual delivery of those systems it's going to affect it's going to affect those those margins uh, also this is this is a pretty small company as you mentioned they were just founded in 2009 so they're a decade and a half old. Uh, this company has done a lot of growing up the last few years, uh, most certainly since the IPO, but especially the last three years here. Uh, from quarter to quarter, yes, we're going to get some variability in those, those gap profit margins. But as the company has grown up, it looks like on an annualized basis, that cash flow was getting more consistent. And then the free cash flow basis, which excludes non-cash expenses, as well as employee stock-based compensation. Uh, this slide the company points out here in their latest presentation, it's really quite impressive, really. Uh, their cash flow has really ramped up here the last few years. It looks like this is a very highly profitable company on a free cash flow basis. So the stock-based comp, uh, I don't think is something investors need to harp too much on at this point. Uh, this is this is a highly profitable business and it has the potential we think to be a very shareholder friendly business via maybe uh, some stock purchases in the not so distant future. Recently on one of our videos, I asked you about pipeline and we had an interesting discussion about that and how that doesn't necessarily, just because you have something in your pipeline doesn't mean that you're actually going to make money off of it. So Pure Storage had an, another slide that I liked that showed something a little bit different, and that is remaining performance obligations. And you explained this to me that it's a it, it's significantly different than pipeline. How is that? Yeah. So so two parts of this this chart that you you picked out here, Casey. Uh, the orange is deferred revenue. Deferred revenue actually goes on the balance sheet. Uh, this is, it goes down as a liability because it's work that a company has done and they've billed for, but they have not received the revenue yet. So you can see that the consistent growth in pure storage is deferred revenue. And then on top of that is where they put this unbilled remaining performance obligations or RPO. So RPO, this is basically revenue that's actually under contract but maybe the work hasn't been completed yet, the service hasn't been delivered yet, and so therefore it hasn't been billed. But it is under contract. So again, steady growth here in the company's RPO and in tandem together with deferred revenue, you can see kind of some nice consistent growth that you tend to see with a software business and a subscription-based business model. But this is a storage business, surprise. So. Uh, that's what's going on here. You mentioned that Pure Storage has done a lot of growing up in the last few years. So why don't we talk about valuation now? Yes. So uh, Casey, again, on a gap basis, this company is not yet profitable, although they are showing signs that they will be consistently very soon. Uh, so let's maybe just use free cash flow uh, on a trailing 12 month free cash flow basis. Pure Storage actually trades for pretty reasonable 20, 21 times free cash flow. Uh, and if, that, of course, in, includes a little recent bump in the stock price after the last earnings report and, you know, maybe fueled by some, some of the AI hype as well. Because, again, a lot of storage, a lot of data needed for AI. So perhaps some optimism here that this company is going to have a, another growth spurt in, in the next year or two alongside some of its, some of its com compatriots in the uh, compute and the networking part of the business. So 20, 21 times free cash flow, uh, Micron trading for uh, a very high valuation on a trailing 12 month basis because uh, demand has tanked and profitability has tanked. Uh, but that's a little bit of a misnomer because we have to look at, at on a forward basis. But I think even on a forward basis, it looks like pure storage is maybe the, let's say, cheaper stock if we can, if we can, if we can use that, 
use that phrase here than uh, than pure storage. As we mentioned earlier, we do hold some shares of Micron. We do not yet hold pure storage, but this is going to be on our watch list. Is there a price target that we're waiting for to purchase pure storage? I think for us, this is a dollar cost average candidate. Um, maybe once a quarter, maybe not once a month with this one, but once a quarter, uh, starting with this month, June, 2023, we'll nibble on this a little bit, wait and see what happens. And then another three months, assuming nothing changes with the story, uh, we'll go ahead and allow the, the, the DCA plan to go ahead and execute the next purchase. And over the course of maybe the next year, we build this up into like a 1% position of our total portfolio? Maybe. Um, this would be complementary to our, our Micron position. And here's the reason why I say that, Casey, you know, for this, for this current fiscal year, which ends um, in January, 2024, another six or seven months, the market, Wall Street analysts expecting only about 7% growth. Basically, growth in subscriptions offsetting a down year for actual sale of hardware. Uh, but then maybe a comeback next year in both units. The forecast, the consensus right now, about 15% revenue growth next year. But free cash flow margins making a nice little run going from maybe 16, 17% this year up to something north of 20% next year. So we like that, right? We like companies that have not just revenue growth and that are profitable, but also rising profit margins. You get kind of get a dual tailwind for companies like this, that when they grow, their profit margins also increase by a significant amount. Um, and that can really propel the stock higher and create kind of a floor for it as it, as it moves forward. So I think pure storage it looks by all intents and purposes right now, fairly valued. And if the company can execute in its growth and ramp up those free cash flow profit margins, uh, we think there's upside ahead for it in the next year or so. There you have it. That's our episode for today. Just to recap, we own all of the companies that we mentioned today, AMD, NVIDIA, Apple, Micron, and we're going to be adding to our portfolio with pure storage this month. Hit us up with any questions that you may have. We are very diligent in trying to respond to your comments. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the bell, don't miss a video. As always, thank you to Main Street Data. We love using their software for our data analysis. Link for your premium subscription in our description of this video. See you next time at Chipstock Investor.